On today's episode, we're talking about Big Turk Tigler, Young Turk Nowitzki, the Shin Goat himself, Alperin Shangoon. Let's get it. Welcome to another episode of State of the Rockets, the premier Houston Rockets podcast. Uh, honestly, it's like the people's champ of Rockets podcasts. Paul Wallaby, baby. There you go, Paul Wallaby, baby. Uh, my name is Roosh Williams. I'm your host. I am also host of the Noble and Roosh show uh, presented by Ball is Life. You can get that anywhere you get your podcast. We interview NBA players, beat, write, beat writers, journalists, uh, that sort of thing. So check it out. Me and my co-host Zach Noble rock with that. And I'm also host of State of the Rockets, like I said, along with Jackson Gatlin. And I'm your other host right here. I also host many other shows. I host uh, Locked on Rockets, talking about the Rockets five days a week. I'm right here at State of the Rockets. I also host Locked on NBA every single Monday, three interviews from around the NBA, the biggest stories around the league. And I'm also the founder of ClutchCityControlRoom.com. Com. You can follow me on Twitter at JT Gatlin. You can follow the Mastodon over there at Roosh Williams. And today we're talking a little Alper and Shingun. Yeah, I mean, man, I, I always forget how many shows you host. Uh, it's, it's kind of it's kind of overwhelming to just listen to you list all the shows you host. That's great. Two is a lot for me in addition to my regular life. So hosting like seven or eight shows. That's that's insane. Yeah, we're talking about Alper and Shingun. Um probably the most most delicious item on the menu for these young rockets <laughs> a <laughs> no, turkish but, delight if you will oh there you go i didn't even realize i was queuing that up yeah i mean probably the biggest surprise of the season i remember watching the draft and and you know the rockets moved up to 16 and they drafted him i knew the rockets were trying to move up in that draft right they were really really trying to move up i didn't know it was for alpern shangun my guess is that 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 the selection of shangun was some type of compromise right um, you know, between the analytics folks who, who might have favored Evan Mobley, maybe some of the numbers or some of the the internal kind of data that the Rockets ran or their models that they have internally. Uh, maybe some of those projected Shangun to, to not be so far off from Mobley with Jalen Green still projecting to be special. And they were thinking, hey, we could draft Jalen Green. And if there's a way to, to move up and nab Shangun. And they were they were willing, they tried to go as high as sixth. They were willing to take Alperin Shangun sixth in the draft. And he fell to 16. Um so I remember they drafted him and I thought, I don't know much about this kid. And then I looked into him and I thought, wait, what? A 6'9 post-up player? You know, and he's 18 in the Turkish league. Okay. Sounds like a project. No, not a project. The kid is ready. Summer, summer league cl uh, clearly rolled around and we got to see what he was made of. And I think a lot of Rockets fans fell in love off the bat. The season rolled around. He didn't get near as much playing time as I think many of us thought he should. However, we saw the flashes. He had some of his big moments. And then towards the end of the season, we finally saw him get busy, um, you know, and, and got some starts. And, and we really got to see what's going on with him. So I'm really excited about Shangun. He's still 19 years old. He does not turn 20 until like mid-July. So the Rockets will have drafted their new their new round of rookies by the time uh, before, actually, Alperin Shangun turns 20. So that's crazy. He could still potentially grow. Um, but there's a lot to discuss, you know. There's a lot of questions. I see Rockets Twitter talking about potentially trading Alper and Shingun. We can we can have those discussions, although I think that's like not the not the mindset to be having right now because we might have something special unless you're like really trying to sell high and bring back someone of star caliber who is like an established star. But that's a different discussion. So so Jackson, like kick me off here. I mean, where do you want to start? There's so much Shingun we could talk. Well, no, it's 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 not a different discussion. Subtweet me, if you will, my my fellow host. I, I I went on Twitter the other day. I unlocked my phone, opened the Bird app, and for whatever reason, compelled me to put it out there into the ether, into the universe. I was just like, hey, like, would you remotely consider trading Alper and Shingun? Because I think that is kind of a, a pivotal question. Here is 
is Alper and Shingun at, at least maybe not the same level of untouchable that Jalen Green is, but I think that with where the Rockets organization is at and with how strongly Jalen Green finished the season, right, with the insane burst of 30-point games, all of that, he answered the question, like, this is the guy moving forward, right? Like, this is the franchise piece. So that said, I think you can kind of take, you know, comfortably – Take Jalen Green into some of your future like decision making, right? Like you, you kind of account for him. You think, okay, well, how would Paolo Bancaro or how would Chet Holmgren or Jabari Smith fit with Jalen Green? Because you can kind of safely think, all right, he's going to be our franchise cornerstone. He's going to be the guy, the alpha moving forward. What I wonder, and where I was kind of getting to with this, you know, hypothetical Shingun trade that people were just vehemently opposed to, is. Is Shingun that same level of untouchable as Jalen Green? Maybe not that far, maybe not like completely untouchable like Jalen Green, but I wanted to see how far people would maybe be willing to go, right? If you're guaranteed like one of the top prospects in this year's draft, and I think that was kind of where I was coming from it with is like, you know, do you look at a Chet Holmgren or a Paolo Bencara or a Jabari Smith and you compare them to Shingun and you think, no, I definitely rather have one of those guys on this team right now even if it meant picking up another future asset in next year's draft, which was some like the kind of, that was kind of the trade permutation it was basically like trade Shingun. You get to move up in this year's draft and you also secure a draft pick from next season, from whatever team, you know, landed at two or three or wherever you're trying to move up to. And that was kind of what I was trying to get at with Shingun because I honestly like as hype as I am about him, he's incredibly talented, all that. I think there's some really big question marks about his his role on a potential championship contender, especially if he's got to be the five on that team. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. I think conventional wisdom is basically going to be or is going to say that you don't draft for fit at the top of the draft, right? Rebuilder, got to go best player available. The thing that makes that tricky, though, is that there is no consensus best player. So it's really a matter of judgment. For the Rockets, right, and and that's kind of what's what's difficult in this discussion is none of us know, and none of us are gonna know for two or three years who that best player is, right, or maybe even longer than that. But we're not gonna have an idea for, I'd say, a while. So, do you factor him in? Do you draft around him? Not necessarily. Does he have some holes? He does. You know, defensively there are question marks. Is he a five? Can he play four? Can he play the four? I would say he can. I mean, we saw what Cleveland did this season kind of going unconventionally big. And and honestly, the NBA's return to the big man in a lot of ways. It's not, you know, a back-to-the-basket post-up game like it used to be, but big men have a place on the floor um, in the right lineups, right? Maybe you could argue not with with Rudolph Gobert and, and the Utah Jazz recently, but again, that's a different discussion. But, but bigs work again in basketball. So maybe it's as simple as having the right five behind Shangun if he does play the four. Maybe he grows. Uh, maybe he comes back defensively. Honestly, he's good. I think he's pretty good defensively. He's just a, a little undersized to play the five full time like that. Um, I still think he's got some room to grow athletically and get like a kind of tap into some of what he's got because he has some natural ability. Like we see him block shots, right? The timing and, and the leap that he gets. And we see him dunk sometimes on like we, we see him poster people, right? So the athleticism is there. It's not like he's a pure finesse guy. Um, kind of like with, with Luis Scola, right? Like we never saw that type of thunder from Luis Scola. Luis Scola was not getting up and blocking people. He no. was not, you know, I don't think he was dunking on people. You might find a couple clips, but I don't remember Scola like mashing on people the way Shangun has. It, it was he, it was rare when Luis Scola got up high enough for a dunk. Like it happened maybe like I can count the number of times like as a Houston Rocket that he dunked on like one hand probably. So right, right, and so and Shangun uh, averaged 0.9 blocks per game. You know, so he played 72 games. He got 68 blocks, pretty much one block in each of them. For reference, someone like DeMontis Sabonis uh, has like, I think, less than three times that many blocks per game. Or sorry, that many blocks in the total of his career. And he's played seven seasons in the NBA. So some of the comparisons for Shangun that we make, like a Sabonis, I think is a really good, accurate comparison. He's got advantages over defensively. And I think that's kind of hidden. And I, and I think it's kind of mucked up by how bad the Rockets are on defense, period. You know, um, I'm not saying Shangun is like an elite defender or anything like that, but I think that he actually did a pretty decent job for what he was asked to do. But the Rockets got mixed up on a lot of pick and roll coverages, you know, like not knowing who's supposed to go where and that just left players vulnerable. Um, and then there were times where he'd block a shot or clean things up, but someone was not on the backside to clean up the rebound or box out his man since Shangun left to jump and block the shot, whatever it is, right? So... Yeah, 
and he can't shoot, right? So he shot, I think, 24, 25% from three. The form looks like it is there. It's just going to take some time. I would be surprised if with an offseason of work, he didn't come back like around 30%. I could see him coming back like around 30, 31%, which isn't great. But if Shangun could make threes at around the same rate as Jay Sean Tate, I think that would be an improvement. I I, tr I believe in the form, right? Like I, I believe in the shot, and I think that that is isn't necessarily so much the worry. But I, you brought up a really interesting point there, right? Because Demontis Sabonis, I think, is a really great kind of comp, you know, for Shingun. Just the the kind of kind of stylistically the way those two guys play, you know, kind of maybe not true true blue like old school back to the basket big, but just stylistically those two guys are kind of similar in how they approach the game. And what does that then tell you, Roosh, if you look at the way the Pacers had, were forced essentially to make that decision between Sabonis and Miles Turner. Because if you look around the NBA landscape, who would be the ideal five to pair next to Alper and Shingun to potentially kind of try to mask some of his potential defensive deficiencies? It would be an athletic five with some length that can space the floor from three. That's exactly what Miles Turner was. And for some reason, that pairing between Turner and Sabonis never quite worked. Like it was, it was always kind of clunky. There was always a, a bit of a, you know, kind of confusion as to like, why can't these two guys coexist on the floor together? Like what exactly was the issue? Because on paper, they should be a per, they should be a match made in heaven. And yet for some reason it never works. So if that's the case, and if we look at, you know, what could con conceivably happen with Shingun further down the line, then what then becomes the best player to pair with an Alper and Shingun? I know we already kind of, ha you know, hammered home the point of you don't draft for fit in the draft, right? Like, but that said, I think it's an interesting thought experiment to figure out what type of player do you put next to Shingun? Because if he could kind of round out the three-point shot, right, get it to around 33, 34, maybe 35 percent, then if you were put a, like a rim running big next to him, somebody that can actually give you some vertical spacing, some size, maybe be your anchor defensively. That seems like a really exciting, enticing lineup. I, you know, I threw around the name Jalen Duran earlier this season over at Locked On Rockets. But if you can't get to that point, or if Shingun has to play the five, then what do you put next to him? Like a lengthy four? You just run super small. I, I, I'm trying to figure out the best kind of complementary piece to Shingun, and that's where I kind of draw a blank. Yeah, and I, I think that's that is the difficult part. Um, I think what you said about Sabonis and Miles Turner is is correct. It is reason for concern, but I don't want to be premature with the concern because I don't want to box Shangun in, right? He's, he is very similar to Sabonis, um, but that doesn't mean that he is Sabonis necessarily. Now, the difficulty with, Sh with Shangun is he needs the ball in his hand. on w Without being able to shoot threes at a high clip, he needs the ball in his hands to be effective on offense. He needs to run the offense or post up, right? And so it's difficult for a lot of guys to play off the ball like that, you know? Um, I, I will say he's, he, well, to be fair, to give him a little bit of credit, right? He's a really effective screener offensively. Like he sets yeah. damn good screens. And so he does still impact the game a little bit that way. But I completely get what you're saying. Like if he's not, you know, actively running or, or playmaking the offense with the ball in his hands on the block or at the high, you know, at, at the top of the key, whatever, making the decisions, you know, he doesn't, he's not a roll threat towards the rim, right? He's not like the, well, no, no, he is, get, he well, is. He can catch. He's not a lob threat. He's not a lob there, threat. There, that's that's fair. Okay, but he can also go to the dunker spot. Um, you know, he knows, and like you said, he can do the dirty work, set a screen, and like do those things. So, so for those reasons, I I still think he's like I think that he's smart enough and skilled enough to make it work. Now, to answer your question, who's the ideal fit next to him? It's unfortunate that we didn't we never really got to see this to to even get a taste of it. But that person might be the twenty fourth pick of the same draft as him. It might be Usman Garuba. Or 23rd pick, I'm sorry. It could be. I mean, it could be like this hustle, you know, rangy, long, hustle, physical guy. If Garuba can hit a three at a decent rate, another guy that knows how to roll, just someone that has Shangun's back when he's doing what he's doing, you know, gets that tip in when when a when a ball rolls on the rim or sets the right screen or, you know, keeps the ball alive and it goes back to, you know, just like that kind of complimentary piece where he knows his role, puts his head down and just gets after it. Um, Miles Turner not to his discredit, but I think that Miles Turner is also more of kind of like a, hey, you know, I could be, you know, a 15 and 10, 20 and 10 type guy, right? Like he has more, he has big, his sight set on bigger things, right? As a player, higher potential. And he knows that. Um, whereas I feel like someone like Garuba could really just be like, yo, I'm going to rebound and set screens and play defense and box out. And like, that's, that is what I do. So y'all do the rest, right? Something like that could work. The size may not work, but I think they'd make a if Shingun can hit like a legit six ten, and you have six ten 
Shangun and 6'8 Garuba with Garuba's wingspan and Shangun's like timing and they're both very physical. So I could see it working, but I didn't really get a chance to to even, you know, get like the smallest view at it because Silas never ran it for some reason. But so we have a we have a few questions to answer, man. You know, is he a cornerstone? Is he untouchable in trades? Uh, I think we just discussed kind of the best way to build around him, maximize him. We can go into that deeper. Um, and then we can talk about, you know, who on the who on the team fits better. So do you want to start off and answer? Is he a cornerstone? That I mean, that's I feel like that's a good place to start, and I think that's it, it is a really tough question, right? Because how, at what point do you see enough flashes from a player where you you deem them either a a cornerstone or, or you know quote unquote untouchable in trade talks? And, and I think that's where I think at times, especially as fans, you know, you need to be able to take off the red tinted shades and be like, okay, like what if if you can get back more value right like if you if you equate let's just pretend for even a split second right if you think that shingun and, and any one of these top prospects in this year's draft are on the same level be it paolo chet jabari whoever and if you could get one of those prospects guaranteed in the swap for shingun and then also pick up further future draft capital moving forward to you know either just line the cupboard with to you know, grease the wheels of a trade down the line, or or potentially just make another draft pick next season in next year's draft, whatever. I think you have to at least heavily entertain that because Shingun has had the flashes. He's looked really, really good, and his numbers have translated. Like especially when you look at like obviously like er earlier in the season, right? He wasn't getting the minutes, so we were like cranking out those per thirty six numbers like crazy. We were like, if he gets the minutes, he's gonna put up these numbers. And then he got the minutes and he put up the numbers, which was insane to see because it actually held true to what we were all clamoring for the entire season. And so it's so weird to think about a guy that like delivered in, in almost every sense of the fashion. When we went through our player grades, I gave him an A plus. That was the highest grade that I gave to any player. And yet I'm still sitting here, not necessarily like trying to push him out the door. Like I'm not looking for trades for Alper and Shingun, but that said, I think you have to be open to it because he hasn't shown that he's a cornerstone. I think Jalen is a cornerstone, guaranteed. Shingun isn't necessarily a cornerstone yet. Very, very good player? Probably. I think you can comfortably say that. Not a cornerstone, though. So I forgot to add this to my answer when talking about who who would potentially be the best fit with him. It could be a guy like Jabari Smith. 6'10", has the wingspan, also able to block shots, switchable on defense, can cover for some, for some of the defensive like lateral um, you know, slowness, if that's a word, uh, that Shangun has, um, but still spreads the floor, can shoot, you know, has the size, like can kind of basically play that stretch four effectively while doubling down as like a, a defensive three and D wing at times as well. So that could be the that could be the look. Uh, but look, what you said about the per 36 numbers, it, it's correct, right? Alperin Shangun, I, I don't know what he finished with. I think it was like 20 minutes per game, somewhere around there. But for the last six, um, let's actually see. Oh. 20.7 okay. minutes he, per he's game. He's figuring out basketball reference. Don't worry. <laughs> 20.7 minutes per game, which is impressive, man, because at one point it was like 18. So the minutes he got at the end of the season really obviously seemed to help. But the last six games of the season, okay, he started the last five in a row, but we're going to count the last six because he he played a good amount of minutes. Last six game of the, games of the season, he averaged 32 minutes a game, 15 and a half points, eight rebounds, 4.3 assists, one block, um, Let's see, 50% from the field, 25% on 3.3 attempts. I've said this before, that's hilarious, just shooting 25% and jacking up three a game. And he shot 87% from the free throw line on four attempts per game. So when he gets the numbers, he produces and he and he he gets it done. Now, as far as selling him, like, is he a cornerstone? I say potentially, but not necessarily. He could be, um, but he's not untouchable. I think the only untouchable right now is Jalen Green. There is a world where... By the way, it's raining behind me. I don't know if the microphone's picking that up, but if it is, I apologize. It is um, not, so you are all good, my guy. You'll get some ambient sounds in the background to my soothing voice. Um, nice little ASMR here at State of the Rockets. Just let's be very <laughs> quiet for a second and just pick up the raindrops. <laughs> 92.5 FM, 97.5 FM, State of the Rockets. No, so... Um, <laughs> so um, but anyways, uh, so he puts up the numbers, right? And, and so you could theoretically sell high if you see, hey... He's got a ton of talent, but we see like the ceiling with him and we we want to avoid getting there. You could sell high, but I think you'd have to really, really get something back. You couldn't just like 
clear room and you know kind of do it you know do a trade for Shengun. You could be looking at a situation like the Lakers kind of giving away um, Ivica Zubac for basically nothing, and then you know not not that they play the same way, but just kind of one of those things where it's like they got rid of the guy for what reason, right? He could have actually been helpful to them down the line at some point. So I think, man, the offensive talent. Like at the end of the day, this game is about putting the ball in the bucket. And with Jalen Green and Shangun as rookies, two guys that are just offensively very capable, it's a great place to start. If you can add the right talent this draft, you know, I, I, I'm high on him. So I think we both agree, not untouchable, but you still want to keep him around and see, like, if you could grow him, could he become an untouchable or could he could he become borderline untouchable? And, and um, I think it is worth noting to, to just throw in one more point on this on this part of the conversation is that he wasn't necessarily put in a position to become a cornerstone piece, right? And, and I think Steven Silas like mentioned that, and obviously he's, anybody with a pair of eyeballs can tell. Like he's he's ahead of schedule. He is. I think he absolutely he's ahead of uh, ahead of schedule, and even so much so to the point that the Rockets organization acknowledged that, right? Like the way that they were structured with their roster, for all intents and purposes, they planned on developing him and taking a lot longer to develop him. That's why they picked up Daniel Tice on you know a multi-year deal because they wanted. Tyson Wood to be the starting bigs, and they thought that they had something with Alper and Shingun, but that they were going to bring him along slowly as the third big, the tertiary big in the rotation. Usman Garubo is going to be the project big that really needed to refine his game offensively, all of that. And then when they realized just how good Shingun was, they were like, ah, crap, we got to get Tice out of here because we got to get this kid minutes. We can't not give him minutes. Well, and so they they went that route, but he still wasn't given or afforded the opportunity to really shine in the way that he that we think that he can offensively, right? The Rockets never like made him the focal point of their offense. They ran a, a, some stuff through him, but I think to really unlock Shingun, you, you make him almost your primary playmaker on the floor and you run a lot of action around him. And that's not something that we saw a ton of this season, unfortunately, to really take advantage of his skill set. Yeah, the, the double big lineup not working kind of, kind of ruin things there. And, and, you know, just a side note, it's really funny. Had Jay Sean Tate been benched for maybe Eric Gordon or KJ Martin or someone who could sp spread the floor better, maybe that whole thing never, maybe the whole double big thing never happens. And Shane been, comes off the bench and, you know. It's so, it's so funny you mentioned that because I, every single time that I catch myself referencing the, the, you know, the hellish double big lineup that like ruined the start of the Rocket season, I've started referencing it as the double big lineup or the two non-shooter lineup because that's really what the issue was, right? It's it was Tate. having two non-shooters, well, two of them in Tice and Tate, right? Like you right. got to pick one. And right, having but, both of them on the floor is what mucked everything up. Yeah, yeah, 100%. But if you're going to pick one of those positions that can't shoot, what are you going to pick the the small forward? Cause Jay Sean Tate was playing small forward. You're going to pick the undersized six, four wing that can't shoot. Or are you going to pick the guy that, you know, can at least play center, right? Like just from a coaching perspective, it's like when I, when I look, when I think of Silas, I'm like, were you tanking or were you trying to win with that lineup? I hope, I hope you were not trying to win with that lineup because it doesn't make sense, but regardless. So, we need, um, we need we need to continue putting respect on the name of future NBA champion with the Boston Celtics, Daniel Tice. Hey, I got love for Daniel Tice. I mean, he didn't work in Houston, but he's a he's a good player. And look, kind of like Gobert, right? Gobert's not working in in Utah, but if you put him in the right team, he'd be a monster, right? It's just like the NBA is about or basketball is about fit. And Daniel Tice, the Rockets had too many issues for Daniel Tice to shore them up, and you know. But anyways, totally different we're, discussion. Well, so. but, but we're going down a rabbit hole here, and that's exactly how this show is going to work. That's basically what it's been you know, in its entirety through two and a half episodes. We're about halfway through this one, so I think I can say two and a half episodes. <laughs> but I will say quick shout out to John Corrales, who hosts Locked on Celtics and did a segment with me the other day for Locked on NBA. Call, reference Daniel Tice said he's like a spare tire because <laughs> you can't go full speed with him. But uh, but specifically, he didn't say spare tire. He was like he's like a donut. And it took me a second to process what he meant in, in this like analogy. It was great. He was like because he'll get you where you gotta go, but you just can't go full speed. And then he right. like broke it down. And I just thought that was like the best analogy ever for Daniel Tice. A lot of love for Daniel Tice, constant professional, even though it didn't work out here in Houston. No, I think that's a great way to put it because it's like he he's not a bad player, but if you're a team as bad as the Rockets, his weaknesses all, all of a sudden become much worse. And then obviously if they're not – if they're if the weaknesses are accentuated and emphasized by someone like Tate that can't shoot, then it just 
falls off the rails. But but look, man, Shangun, like I said, he's about to turn 20. He's got a year under his belt. And you know what I love the most is that he adds new parts to his game, right? We saw him add the uh, the the Turk Nowitzki, right? The one-legged kind of fadeaway shot. We saw him add the dream shake. He's got a little dream shake in him. He's obviously got his like revolving hooks, the revolving door of right, left hooks and the fakes and the pumps. Clearly, we know he can pass. And if he adds that shot, I think there's a lot to look forward to. So we've kind of discussed what the best way to build around him and maximize him is, but let's maybe dig a little deeper. Um, do you want me to kick it off or do you want to take that? Nah, you go for it. All right. So I think I think the Denver model works, right? He's not Jokic, but if you got guys, and we saw it, right? If you got guys cutting constantly, he will find them and it mucks the defense up. And even if, and that's the beautiful thing about basketball, man, like we get so, people get so obsessed with the, with the, iso dribble skill you know and they say oh this era is so talented and it's true but at the end of the day there are a million ways to create an open bucket and a lot of it has to do with just running if you run and you make defenses have to make a decision right they're chasing you through the lane on a cut they get clipped by a screen someone has to switch all of a sudden the defense is out of coverage someone's open boom pass dunk or someone helps off boom pass pass open corner three like that's the beauty of Shingun. He can stand there, and if you just move, things open up. Now, is that sustainable for four quarters? Probably not. You know, it's a difficult thing to ask. It's hard to get guys that have played their whole game ISOing, like Josh Christopher, Jalen Green, Kevin Porter Jr. It's hard to get them in that mindset of cutting off the ball and, like, seeing the game that way. A lot of these kids kind of see the game as, like, when they have the ball, unfortunately. Jalen moves off the ball really well. Josh found a good chemistry with Shangun, and we can talk about that. They have a really good relationship, um, and I think that that kind of has something to do with their on-court chemistry. Kevin Porter Jr., I think, can benefit from playing with Shangun if they run the pick and roll. We've, we've seen them run the pick and roll, and it works. Christian Wood doesn't run the pick and roll with KPJ. Um, so I think all of that stuff works. We saw DJ Augustine had great rapport with Shangun because he would cut that baseline and Shangun would hit him and he'd also cut down the middle and Shangun would hit him and, and Augustine would I mean he would finish right so if you just move he can get you the ball I do want to see more post-ups I have this like weird feeling that Silas is anti post-up because we didn't really see like it seemed like there were no designed post-ups for Shangun or if there were they were minimal um and then sometimes guys just couldn't make the entry pass to post him up but the best way to maximize them is to get players that know how to cut, get players that can catch and shoot, and have athletes, right, that you can you can catch and finish in traffic. Uh, you can finish through defenders and through contact. You can catch that baseline alley-oop. And then guys that can catch and shoot. I think K.J. Martin has worked really well with Alper and Shengun. We saw that. Some of the best plays of the season came between those two throwing alley-oops to each other, right? Um, and and Shengun had a couple – Amazing, like behind the back, you know, bounce past dimes that KJ Martin either finished or a couple of them I, I remember he got stuffed on. So those types of players, athletes that know how to move without the ball and then also fill in some shooters around them. And that sounds simple enough. But um, but yeah, I think if the Rockets can basically get another year to grow, but play their young core more and then add a talent, maybe like a Jabari Smith then that can really maximize Shangun. I will say there are reports that the Rockets are prioritizing Paolo Bancaro. Could be a great talent. I don't see how he fits with Shangun. So if they do if they do go with Bancaro, I think they might face that conundrum you were describing earlier. Yeah, you know, I think because at that point, it's not it's not even so much I'm worried about like how they coexist offensively. It's more just because even if you do have to take you know, take turns, you know, have Palo with the ball in his hands, which is where he's, you know, arguably most effective, then, you know, you are kind of taking away what Shingun does so well, which is his playmaking offensively. I get that. But to me, it's more just, you know, the nightmare scenario of what those two guys would look like defensively if that's your four or five, you know, for the for the foreseeable future. But it's it's funny you bring up those points about the the chemistry specifically with certain guys on the roster, because I absolutely agree. I think that like Josh and Al P developed a ton of chemistry as the season went on. And I, I will highlight their relationship a little bit more in a, in a second here. Uh, shout out to our guy, Scrooge and Corey, uh, who wanted, who inquired about their relationship uh, during our last episode. And we unfortunately didn't get to highlight it. So we'll dive more back into that in a second, but KJ Martin, Josh Christopher and DJ Augustine all fed uh, fed off of and played off of Alper and Shingun incredibly well. And I really think, and I think you were the one that mentioned this or, or put, you know, floated this idea on the timeline, but like some version of like, maybe like the Lakers, like triangle offense with Shingun 
and like having guys just cutting and and setting picks and screens and really just moving without the basketball. But you put Shingun in that high post area and let him kind of work and just see what options are there. He's a great decision maker with the basketball. We saw that develop as the season went on. And I will, even though he, you, you, you know, no designed post-ups by Steven Silas, just very little, you know, like if, if he got the seal on somebody and, and somebody actually a recognized it first. And then, cause there were tons of times where Shingun would get the seal on somebody and nobody noticed. And then B, if they did notice, could they actually make the entry pass? Uh, my kingdom for somebody on the Rockets, not named DJ Augustine this season. Cause obviously he got traded or well, waived, not traded, whatever, no longer a rocket. My kingdom for somebody who can make a proper entry pass to Alper and Shingun because it really did feel like there wasn't a single guy on the roster who was comfortable making that entry pass as soon as Shingun like got his man sealed on his back hip, was ready to just like spin and go straight up for an easy two at the rim, and it just never got delivered in a timely manner. That said, get me away from the five-out offense. Like, I'm pretty much done with it at this point. I think the five-out offense works really well when you have an incredibly dynamic player like a Luka or a Harden or a LeBron or a Giannis, right? It give you, give you one of those heliocentric guys that you're just going to throw the ball to and say, all right, either you go get a bucket or you're going to pull like two or three defenders and we're going to get a wide open three. That's fine. But the standing around and it just devolving into ISO and like, can I beat my guy off the dribble and nobody's moving and it's stationary, all that. It's just, it's a pain to watch. And I think there's the players on the floor are significantly more talented and, and capable of doing a lot more. And I think that's the optimism moving forward is that Steven Silas didn't really know what he had with Shingun. Maybe you make the criticism that he should have adjusted his game plan and, and you know, Maybe take take the all-star break to figure out, okay, how can I implement this guy more in the offense? Maybe you make that argument. That said, he's going to have an entire offseason now to figure out how he better wants to deploy Alper and Shingun moving forward and what type of a dynamic offense he can come up with to better accentuate his skills, his you know what, what he can do offensively, and to hopefully make life easier for KPJ and Jalen Green in the process, as well as everybody else on the floor, uh, you know. Yeah, I'll disagree with you on that. I, I think it is a red flag. I mean, it's a losing team. He tried the same thing out there. He tried different lineups, but we didn't see different looks. Um, and that was just from a, just from the the branding of you know offensive genius. Which, by the way, the Mavs seem to have a pretty potent offense without the guy, with a totally different head coach, and even without Luka Doncic. So maybe that was fool's gold. Just throwing that out there. However, um, the triangle. I mean. The, I, I'm not saying the Rockets should run the triangle, although it would be very interesting. Um, but yeah, the triangle, man, you get someone in the post like Scotty, Scotty Pippen in the post that knows how to score on their own, that knows how to pass and create or whoever they would have had. I mean, you could run it with like Luke Longley down there um, if if the kids remember Luke Longley. But yeah, Shangun can pass. You have people cut baseline or cut down the middle and then you just rotate and move around and the space keeps moving. If the ball, you know, you get the ball moving, you get people moving. And like I said, like you don't have to devolve into ISO play. Um, and, and yeah, just athletes, man. Like if you have athletes, you can execute that type of style. I I'm really over the five out offense. I'm with you. There's just so many other weapons and, and five out for the, for a team like the Rockets, at least just turns into ISO. It just turns into four guys standing outside the perimeter, watching the guy with the ball go to work. It could work maybe better if, if guys were, you know, setting down screens for each other, moving without the ball, cutting down the middle, you know, that kind of stuff. But for the reasons I've described, that's just not what the Rockets uh, or what this version of the Rockets seems to do. So and even when they and even when they try, because sometimes, they, you know, sometimes we would see that, right? Like guys would start, but it, it, it really did feel like and it, this is where you look at the team. And you're like, yeah, this is this is a young team. This is a team that's rebuilding and trying to figure things out. You would see guys like try to cut. You'd see Jay Sean Tate like, cut, you know, cut randomly in the middle of a possession, but it would like muck things up because he would cut at the wrong time. Right. Because guys are not quite on the same page. Like he would cut like at the same time, Jalen's like making his boom, boom move towards the middle to try to get to like a mid range Jimmy or, or, yeah. or like KPJ is doing his move, trying to drive to the basket. And then like KJ Martin tries to cut in. Cause he thinks like the shots going up, just not guys, not being on the same page timing wise. And it, it resulted in a lot of ugly possessions, unfortunately. Well, the game moves so quick and you got to process it the right way, you know? And, and, and if you're not looking for something, you'll miss it. And, and by the time you realize it, it's too late. Right. So, yeah, like you said, on a play where KPJ or, or Jalen's isoing and then someone else is cutting, they're just not on the same page, right? But I think that goes back to coaching because it's like you got to coach and watch film to get people to realize that. It's also a state of or a statement on commentary on the state of the game. You know, it's very ISO. It's very ISO heavy. It's very like, yo, 
I'm staring my defender down about to get a bucket, you know, but, uh, so, but we're re so we're rebranding from state of the Rockets to state of the game. Is that what I'm state taking? Of the game. Hey, we could, we could, um, but man, let's, I think it'd be fun to talk about some of our favorite Shangoon games. We can do that. We can we can talk about the favorite games. I, I want to do that. Let me at least toss in the little the little anecdote here, right? About uh, Shingun and Josh Christopher specifically, and, and just kind of their relationship and a reason that they you know kind of seemingly developed that chemistry really quickly with each other. And, and it's because Josh's brother actually played overseas in Turkey, and so Josh kind of coming in with, with Alper and Shingun coming in, not really knowing, not knowing any English at all and kind of, you know, coming over to a brand new country, getting drafted, all of that. Josh was actually one of the first guys on the team to really like embrace and welcome Shingun because he knew some, some Turkish phrases from his brother. Like that was one of the first things he did is he started like texting his brother. He was like, yo, like we got this guy, Alper and Shingun, like, you know, teach me some Turkish phrases so that I can try to like, you know, warm up to him and help, you know, help him feel welcome. And I remember all the way back during, Rockets training camp and the Rockets were down in Galveston and I went down there for a couple days and you know just interviewing the team all that stuff um Josh was talking about like one of the first words that he learned from his brother which is uh Konki and that means brother or or specifically blood brother in, in Turkish and so that's like you, one of the first how do you say it Konki how do you spell like, it like it's it's like I think it's K-A-H N-K-I like some 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 spelling so you're like saying that, Konki, like, Konki not Kangi with a G Correct. It's a K, not a G. Yeah. Okay. So, so that, and that was like one of the first things that he like told us. And he was like, yeah, like that's, that's my brother. That's my conky. Like, and so, you know, they, they, they really developed that relationship from day one. And I do think it's, it's really impressive to see how not just Josh, but it really kind of started with him. I think he was more so the catalyst, how the entire Rockets team really embraced Alper and Shingun, which, you know, could have been, you know, a really hard thing to do, right? Like this guy's coming over. He doesn't know your culture, doesn't know your, your routine, like whatever you're doing. And that could have been really alien for a bunch of like 19, 20 year old kids to just be like, no, nah, I'm not going to, I don't, I'm, I'm focused on me right now. Like, I'm not trying to like worry about him and embracing him and getting him figured out, but the team really did embrace each other. And I think you saw that with Jalen green when he did his exit interview at the end of the season, he was like, he straight up said, he was like, look, I'm just glad that Alper and Shingun's English is getting better because now he and I can have like legitimate conversations with one another. And like, you saw this, you know, big ass grin on Jalen's face and it, it, this, the young guys are really bought into each other's success. And I think that bodes well for the future. I don't think we really saw a lot of like, you know, guys just going out there trying to get theirs, at least not out of the young guys specifically, which could have easily happened a team where you're the worst team in the association. Yeah. And I think that's one of the beauties of summer league, you know? Um, they get to play together, bond together, come into the league together and share, share that experience. Right. And that's, that's kind of where that starts. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's a, that's good background. Uh, hopefully Corey is listening, uh, and, and, you know, heard that, but if, but yeah, he's, not I mean, he's, to, real. if he's not listening, he's dead to us. So that just, we're yeah. just throwing <laughs> their, their chemistry is real, man. I mean, you see it on the court, you, you see it, uh, off the court when they're in post game pressers or, you know, doing their commentary or whatever, they just seem to have a good rapport. With each other and like i said man shangun shangun finds josh i will say and I've, I've talked about this before but when you see the game live in person like if you're at the game you get a you get a much better feel for how often shangun is like barking for the ball and there are times where he gets looked off so i think that's also part of like the awkwardness sometimes he's they're trying to run something else and he's up there saying hey give me the ball give me the ball let me run this because he wants to do it his way and i think that clash needs to kind of be smoothed out and there needs to be some type of balance found because if they don't give him the ball, then he's out of position and, and you're losing time on the shot clock and it kind of breaks down whatever they're trying to run. Um, so there is an adjustment, you know, it's like there's there is really a stylistic difference in the way they're playing the game. And, you know, they were rookies. He didn't get as much time toward, until towards the end. But hopefully with another summer league, another offseason, another preseason, we'll start to see those things uh, kind of smoothed out. So. I think we'll close here in these last however many minutes we decide to rock on for by talking about some of our favorite Shangun games of the season. So would you like to start? I can start or you can start. I mean, I, 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 I think we know, both I'll, have I'll, the, what, I, what, what game are you going with? I know, I know which game you're going with. I think we both have our, uh, you know, a, an equal favorite. Um, I would say the game against the Lakers. You know, he, he had 21 points, 14 boards, two assists, two steals, two blocks, shot nine of 20 from the field, one of three from three. And I think the one three he made was that dagger at the end in overtime. 
if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, he had a 21 and 14 game, which might have been his first 20 point game at the time. I think it was. Yeah, it was his first 20 point game at the time. So that was awesome. And he did it while Jalen had, you know, that awesome 32 point game, which I think was his career high at the time as well. Could be wrong about that. So that one really stands out. I mean, you know, it was just a lot of fun. And it was kind of the first moment where both of them shined at the same time and it resulted in a win. So it was kind of for, for Rockets fans. It was like, oh, my God, I hope this is the future. That kind of thing. What about yeah, you? I, no, I, I'm right there with you on the L.A. game that maybe I think I think that kind of has to almost be like the maybe the game of the season. It's so crazy because that that game to me is is the game of the season for the Rockets for a lot of different reasons for Jalen, for the way he played for the overtime win, like so many great storylines from that game. But the other one that really came to mind to me was the Phoenix game uh, on the road just before all star break. And it's because the Rockets like played a really competitive game against, uh, you know, at the time, well, they not at the time, but still whatever the number one seeded, you know, Phoenix Suns, right? They were, you know, bulldozing through every team in the association. And yeah, maybe it was, you know, the Suns were, you know, letting up off the gas pedal because it's the, it's the young fledgling Rockets and they're not trying as hard, whatever, but the Rockets were taking it to them. And this was a game where Shingun got the start. No Christian Wood in that game. I forget if this was one of those, like, you know, he was battling some like illnesses, like to kind of wrap up the season, like randomly, like had a, he had a few different games where he was just like missing time due to, you know, non COVID related illnesses. And so I forget what the specific reason that Christian Wood was out in that game, but Shingun walked away 19 points, 14 rebounds. He had three assists, two steals, a block, just the one turnover. He got 28 minutes. I remember, I remember everybody being ecstatic about the 28 minutes that night, just like freaking out about the fact that he actually, I think at that point, if I'm not mistaken, that might've been his highest minutes threshold or close to it up to that point. Yeah, no, he had, he had 28 minutes one game before uh, against the Spurs on the road where he did 28, 42. But then after that, yeah, I think that was like his highest minutes total for a while as the season had kind of gone on. And so to actually see him, this was this was like one of those games, right, that I was alluding to earlier where we were wondering like, okay, will his per 36 numbers hold up? Like, will he actually be able to translate? And he did in this game. And the Rockets almost came away with a win in this one. And I, if memory serves, I think this was also like one of the Dennis Schroeder games where Schroeder had like the very first game of his Rockets career and it like was not super great. Yeah, this was the, this was the Dennis Schroeder game where he had 23 points and he looked incredible. Every single one of the Rockets starters looked incredible in this game. Schroeder had 23, Gordon had 20, Jalen had 17, Shingun had 19, and Jay Sean Tate had 22. 22 and 10, I think, for Jay Sean Tate. So Gordon had 20 on 3 of 14 from 3, though, 8 of 24 from the field. Gordon basically saved the tank that night. Um, Shingun, 19 and 14, like you said, also a team best plus 11. Him and Jalen both a team best. They tied as a team best plus 11. So that was another one of those moments where you see Jalen and Shingun having good games and, you know, leading the team. And then that night, Shangun hit three three pointers, three out of four. So, kind of one of those games where you see like, yo, if if this guy's shot is on, um, you know, look out. And it was also another one of those games where it was like, man, if he would have played 34, 35 minutes, the Rockets might have won the game. But he played twenty eight, and at that point in time, um, it was his third highest minute total of the season, twenty four seconds behind the highest after that. So yeah, it was kind of a one of those moments for Rockets fans where we were like, yes, man, look, when you play him. This is what happens. They go toe to toe with the Suns, so that was awesome to see. I I agree. I think that was probably my other favorite Shangun game of the season. Uh, the one against Cleveland where they got blown out was kind of bittersweet because the stats were awesome and he was finally doing it in a real NBA game, but they were getting blown out. Um, but it was still fun to see that. And I think he was like just a point. I think he had 19 and 11. I can't remember. Yeah, 19 and 11, five dimes, two steals, a block. You know, basically the per 36 numbers like coming to life, and he only played 27 and a half minutes um and then let's see anything else oh the portland game it was you know less enjoyable or, or harder to fully enjoy since portland was trotting out you know like a d1 college team basically um against the rockets but he put up 27 points seven boards three dimes a block in what 25 just under 26 minutes 10 of 16 from the floor two of four from three uh, and then getting to the free throw line, five of eight from the free throw line. So it's just one of those moments where you're like, yo, if this kid gets unleashed and they finally feed him the ball, he will produce. Um, 
and you know that's exactly what he did so seeing those per 36 numbers come to life i think is like my favorite part because it's validation right because like you can look at bruno fernando's per 36 numbers and they're ridiculous off the off the charts but you know it's unrealistic but with shangun you look at it and like 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 i said right he had 15 8 and like four point i think three assists per game in those last six when he was actually playing real minutes his six his per 36 numbers are 16.7 points per game, nine and a half rebounds, four and a half assists. I mean, like basically that, you know, um, and, and the numbers that, that I read over that time period was 32 minutes per game. So it wasn't even a full 36. So if he played four more minutes, it would have probably matched his per 36 exactly, or maybe even eclipsed the per 36. So, I mean, I don't know in some dude, I, I just think the Rockets have a really special player. I think I don't think he's going to make the all rookie second team, unfortunately, although I think he has a strong case for it. I think had he played, he would have had he played more. He would have been in contention for rookie of the year just based off the numbers. I think he would have put up like 14 and like nine and like, you know, four dimes or something and been the Rockets version of Herb Jones. There's no there's there's no way he could have been in contention for rookie of the year because he's not uh, impacting winning Roosh. And clearly that's the metric for deciding awards when it comes to rookies in the NBA. Yeah, you're right. You're right. No, you're right. What a loser. (laughs) Uh, Not Shingun, just to clarify, in case you aren't putting the context together. We're talking about he who will not be named Bill Simmons. Anyways, before we close this thing down, though, we, I realized we didn't we didn't really set aside time for this and like our just, you know, very slapdash, like how are we going to talk about Alper and Shingun throughout this episode? Because ultimately, we like to find ourselves in a bunch of rabbit holes and it leads to some very genuine conversation. But what's your favorite play from Shingun this season? Or maybe we narrow it down to just favorite dime. I think so. I'm just going off memory. There's a ton I miss that I'm going to miss because he did an, a ton of awesome things. And honestly, some of his best plays didn't get finished. You know, players either smoked the layup or got stuffed at the rim. Um, but I'm going to go just just because I didn't I haven't watched one of the highlight reels recently, so I don't have them fresh in my head. Um, but what I remember immediately is when he posterized Evan Mobley when the Rockets when the Rockets beat the Cavaliers um, in that one game. I think I think I think he did it with his left hand too. I think he got Mobley on a poster with his left hand. And so that was kind of just an awesome moment. That whole first quarter, he was going at Evan Mobley. Like, I remember Evan Mobley had like 10 or 8 points off the bat, just kind of was cooking Christian Wood. Shangun came in, stonewalled him, and just started bawling. Um, and that was another another kind of thing. You know, I, I think every time we've seen him go toe-to-toe against Evan Mobley, Summer League, in the, in the actual NBA, he plays him so well that it's – kind of redeeming and validating for Rockets fans like okay cool you know I think I think we're really happy with Shangun and Green and we don't have to kind of sit there and mope about Evan Mobley but but yeah I'd, I'd say the dunk on Mobley what about you well I've got I've got two specific plays in mind but the when you brought up the dunk on Evan Mobley it actually reminded me of another instance that I thought was just absolutely hilarious I think it was the first meetup with the Bucks when DeMarcus Cousins was on the 10 day with them and it, it, Alperin Shingun had cousins in fits. Like he was pissed. Remember he picked up like three or four fouls in like the first quarter trying to check Alperin Shingun. And even at one point, like I think Shingun drew a charge on cousins, like just had this man beside himself and cousins wound up getting the better of him. Like the next time the two teams met up, I think and not, it wasn't still on the Bucks. I think Cousins was on the Nuggets. Denver. Yeah, there you go. Because he had, you know flipped around a couple different. Teams yeah, he had that crazy contract. like first quarter or something or f- crazy game. Yeah, he he remembered Alper and Shingun for sure and wanted to show up the Rockets. But it was like that specific matchup against the Bucks where it's like you saw Alp putting in work in that game, getting to the free throw line like at will against Cousins. Happened against Giannis where he got to the free throw line and Giannis after the game was like, yeah, he's he's good. Like this this kid can play. Um, very complimentary of him, but the two plays that I do want to highlight the, the two passes that real, wanna... real quick, real quick, um, just to back you up on the, in that game you're talking about against Milwaukee, December 10th, I was actually there, uh, 15 points, five rebounds, uh, six of eight from the field in 16 minutes. He had 15 and five in 16 minutes was plus 11. And that was in the Rockets loss. And that was another one of those games where I remember thinking, why is this guy not playing? He's obviously making an impact. Like they clearly had an advantage with him on the court. You know, why uh, is he not playing more? And he had, I guess, four fouls in those 16 minutes. So maybe that's the reason. And that's back when he was fouling a lot, but still like let him foul out, get all six. Who cares? But sorry, you said you had two plays. 
Well, it's it's two passes that really stood out to me, and one of them more so for a nostalgia factor, and then the other one just because it was just so absurd. The nostalgia factor one was when he hit Dennis Schroeder on, like Schroeder hits hits him with the entry pass. Al P is just right there with the ball above his heads, and, and Dennis Schroeder cuts baseline around him, and Al P tosses the ball back over his head without even looking. Very reminiscent of the Yao Ming to, I believe it was Katino Mobley on the cut. I was can't remember. Was, I think it was. I think it was Katino Mobley. I'm like 98 percent sure that it was. I want to look Mobley. this up. I want to guess off the top. I want to guess Mucci Norris, but that can't be right. I don't think it was Mucci. I don't remember the hair being there, and I should know because I wound up putting these two clips side by side. But that's why I wanted this from the nostalgia factor is because it immediately reminded me of that play specifically, regardless of who was on the receiving end of it from Yao. It was the behind the head, no look pass, and it looked ident damn near identical. So that play stood out as one of the better passes of the season. And then the other pass, and this was the one that was just – Absolutely, it's like on his top five passes of the entire. Before season. you say this, I just want to know. I, I want to know if there's a way because I have one in my head that I want to talk about, and I want to know if we're about to say the same thing or not. What team is yours against? Well, that would give it away. Um, oh well. Here, let's start here. Is your team is it is it in the Western or the Eastern Conference? Eastern Conference. God damn it! Okay, is it is that team in the playoffs right now? Yes, they are. Are they winning their series? Yes, they are. Okay, I think we're talking about the same team. Is it Boston? Yes, it is. Yes. Dude, the, the dime. Behind the back, behind like three people. Behind three defenders. Yes. That was the that is one of the wildest passes that I've ever seen in a live game scenario where he was buried in the land of the trees, had no business getting that ball out from under there, just barely looks to his right and sees Josh Christopher on the wing and just boop right behind three Celtics defenders. And then the ball gets there and everybody just turns and looks like how, what? Like nobody, nobody ran to close out on Josh. None of that. They were just so astounded. And he made the three the ball there. And he made the three. That's you, you mentioned it, right? The fact that so many of those plays, so many of the highlight level, potential highlight level moments, you know, didn't get converted. We need to, damn it. I'm going to, I'm going to ring up Adam silver tomorrow morning and say, we need a category on NBA.com, basketball reference, whatever, for not just potential assists. I want potential highlight assists because I want to know the number of times that Alper and Jr. was robbed of a potential career like highlight real play because guys just weren't converting shots. Because he had a lot of those like absolutely filthy passes this season where teammates just couldn't quite finish the shot. So yeah, no, that, that play Boston, Boston was, was ridiculous. That Boston one was insane, man. I remember why, and, and you know, the Rockets were down. I'm trying to find this Yao clip. I just can't find it. The Rockets were down pretty sizably too. Like the game was over, you know, they were playing third stringers and it was still exciting. And I think, you know, that's a, one of the best ways to kind of emphasize his awesomeness and, and what made the season fun is he was exciting. You know, like a lot of the time, even when, even when you're losing, you just want to see exciting stuff. Jalen dunking, KPJ nailing threes, whatever. Shangun was exciting, man. Uh, the post play was crazy to watch. Like the little, I've never seen a player do like the fake hooks, like just like rotating until they have an open hook. I've never seen that in my life. Um, and it, it's crazy because it makes sense, but you know, I've just never seen anyone do it, but like, that's how smart he is. He's like, look, I can't get over you. Uh, I can't necessarily back you all the way down and I can't necessarily fade over you yet fade away over you. So I'm just going to like keep moving until you just get off for a second and I'll flip it in. It's crazy. Um, you know, he had some poster dunks, block shots. His block shots are really emphatic. Like, he tosses the ball, you know? Um, the dimes, of course. Like, he was just fun. And I think that's what pissed a lot of people off in the discussion about his minutes is, is it, you know, he's just fun to watch. And if you're going to lose, they, people want to see fun stuff from their young players, you know? They don't necessarily want to see David Nwaba running full speed or some people don't want to see Christian Wood going ISO or, you know, Jay Sean Tate bricking threes. Like, if you're going to lose, lose with some style, lose with some flair, lose with some fun, you know, and, and that's kind of my main takeaway from him is, you know, the season, the Rockets weren't good, but he gave us reasons to be excited. And so for that reason, I'm, I'm really excited to see more of him, especially I'm, you know, what I'm really excited to see is what kind of workout plan does he go with in the off season? Are they going to bulk, bulk him up, up or does he slim down? I'm saying, do they bulk him up? Do they get him like quicker? Do they tap in? Like I talked about earlier to some of that athletic potential and try to make him more springy, a little more. I mean, he's got some handles, dude. He can like break people down and go behind the back. And like, he's got some quick twitch in him. 
Do they refine that? You know, I don't know. Do they make him more springy? I don't know. Um, but he's got the ability. So that's the other thing to kind of urge people to remember is he's still a, he's honestly still a kid. Like he's not even done with his body. He doesn't even like have a full feel for his body yet. Maybe he does, but it's not guaranteed. You know, he could still grow in more, more ways than just vertically. So I'm just excited, man. I just want to see him ball. I hope he starts because we didn't, it took a long time to get him and Jalen on the court together and they worked really well together, especially LP passing to him and Jalen ran some good pick and rolls with LP as well. So I want to see them do that on a nightly basis. I don't want it to feel like this rare occurrence, you know, like, oh my God, yo, we're getting a six minute stretch of Shangun and Jalen to do their thing. You know, I want to see it every night in addition to whoever they add to the team, in addition to the individual growth that every player experiences, in addition to hopefully Steven Silas kind of showing us something. So if all that happens, could be fun. But but that's mainly what I'm looking forward to. In addition to, it was Moochie Norris. I know. I knew it. Thank you. I found, I found the clip. I found the clip. I, I found my clip that it? I did. Oh, I found it on Twitter because I went and I went and found my little like highlight side by side, like Yao and, and oh. you know, Shingun little highlight clip. Got you. And I was on I, YouTube. I spent the last like three minutes of the pod, like, you know, as you're going through your, you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division over there, doing long division on the pod. I was promised there'd be no math. Um, no, but <laughs> um, as you were going through that over there, I'm like staring at this clip and there's about like six pixels in the highlight from like Yao and Moochie. And I'm like staring at the jersey and I'm like, what number is this? Because the it's, I mean, Moochie was wearing 12. Problem is, there's again like there. I can like count the pixels in this video, and the one is like blending in with the stripes, like the pinstripes on the jersey. So I thought it was jersey number two for a second. I'm like staring at the roster. I'm like, it wasn't Mo Taylor. Like Mo Taylor was six nine. Like this isn't Mo Taylor <laughs> running off of a you know a give and go with Yao in the post. So I was seriously struggle busting here for the last three minutes. So I'm glad we got that figured out. Speaking of the pinstripes, I'll end this by saying I hope. I hope they bring those city jerseys back. I hope that was not a one and done uh, because I really enjoyed the city jerseys this season. And I think it's cool to see everyone kind of fall back in love with those, with that era of uniform. I think we all have a sour taste in our mouth from that era because it didn't go as planned. And because the Barkley thing kind of blew up the championship team and it didn't work out. And so I think that's why people hate that logo and say that they like hate that era of uniform. But it's honestly kind of badass. Like I think it's hilarious and awesome that that rocket had teeth. It's still funny to this day that the Rockets logo had teeth. Go back and look. The Rocket has teeth. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad they did that city jersey. I hope they bring it back, but we will see. It was, any- it was a very, it was a very late nineties, early two thousands look like the rocket having, you know, teeth. That was just, I mean, it just fit well, the brand. Dude, of go that back, era. yo, run, run, run the logos of that era back. I remember I was a kid and I had my bed sheets were <laughs> NBA bed sheets. And so uh, actually funny story. I had, bed sheets that were like all logos right from that era so like the piston the 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 teal pistons with the horse or whatever you know the hawk the huge hawk with its claws like dug into the basketball that rocket all that stuff and then i had chicago bulls comforter uh cuz i was just like a huge huge jordan guy but but anyways so that era of of logo was like over the top exaggerated but honestly probably possibly the best not the best but definitely up there don't sleep on it. Cooler than what we got now, I would say. I definitely hope they they bring back the uh, the the. I forget if it, if they're officially called the mixtape jerseys or the remix jerseys. It's one of those. I think it's mixtape. I think that's what the name like because they're the city edition. But I think officially they were calling them the city edition like mixtape jerseys because they mixed up like all the different like you know the the different eras and like all if that you good look stuff. At, if, if you look at the Timberwolves right now, their their throwback, the one they rock tonight, the jerseys they rock tonight in Game Three against Memphis. It's the colors of the early 90s, which was one of the dopest color schemes out there, mashed up with their like late 90s, you know, very aggressive looking Timberwolf. And it's, it's man, it's just so clean. Like I'm looking at these old ones, uh, these old logos. They're just so dope. I, I am really worried that obviously last season, right, they, they, since they introduced the City Edition jerseys, you know, I am worried that they've, you know, that they're running with the idea that each Jersey is a one-off to try and like 
be creative every season and come out with like a That's new gonna edition. That's going to get old quick. They're going to run I out know. of ideas quick. And, 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 and not only that, but I, I'm worried because this season, right, the reason they did the the uh, mixtape jerseys to honor the previous years is because it was the 75th anniversary. That's where that idea kind of stemmed from. So I hope they don't retire that jersey because like you, I do agree. I think the jersey looks incredible. And I will say that I think a big part of it too is the fact that they didn't have a white variant of it. It was just the blue one. Like of the pinstripe jerseys, I like the pinstripes but I really like the blue pinstripe, like yeah. the away jersey. And hey, so not having to see like the white with like the faint blue was like nice. Are any are any white jerseys tight these days? I think I white think jerseys are a thing. One off the top of my head. I think they're they're mostly a thing of the past. I don't really think people like, like I think the, the color in the jerseys and the designs is kind of what makes them pop. I, you know I, what? I no, I've got I've got a fiery hot take to close out the show because we wanted to close out the show like 10 minutes ago. Yeah. And then we started talking about jerseys. <laughs> I loved the simplicity of the NASA Space City jerseys from the Harden Russ like year. Those mm -hmm. space jerseys were so clean. And those were the first like what like all white jerseys that I actually liked in a long, long time. Cause you're right. Normally the white jerseys, you're like, eh, whatever. Like, don't care. It's boring. I liked the NASA space themed ones. Those ones were awesome. I wish that they would bring those back. They're cool. I don't mind them. I'm not like crazy for them. I, I don't, I just don't really like the use of uh, H Town. It's just kind of like, it just sounds like uh, some transplant, like H Town, you know, like, it's, you know what I mean? It's, I don't know. But I, I don't hate them though. I'm with you. I was going to say, last thing I'll say is, I, I don't know if there's like an IP issue, intellectual property issue, or if there's some licensing issue or something. Why? I don't know why they don't bring back the jersey that's behind you. Um, and or bring back the ones we're talking about from the from the mid to late nineties. Like fans clearly love those jerseys more than any jersey the Rockets have had since. I will say one of the best things that's happened during the Fertitta era is the revamp and the redesign of the jersey because the Yao, the the Yao era jerseys and the font and the logo, some of like my least favorite jerseys in the league, Rockets aside, just the league. So Rockets history, definitely the worst. So I don't know why they don't bring those back. I don't get it. You know, it's all right. Last point here, and then we'll shut things down. <laughs> last, yeah. uh, last word. I got the, the last, last word. The last, la in addition, in addition, in addition. No, a shout out to uh, Clutch fans, uh, Dave Hardesty, amazing guy. Shout out to his platform, the uh, you know, longtime forum for diehard Rockets fans everywhere. It has been very think, cool to see him engage on Twitter and to see the Clutch fans forum kind of come to life with like a name and a voice in like a very modern way. It's been very, been very cool to see. Shout out to Dave. He's he's like revered as the OG and he just really does nothing but give back. So very cool. He he is absolutely a, a one of a kind amazing individual, but where I'm going with this is I remember and I lost my shit when I saw this on the Clutch Fans thread. Somebody referred to those Rockets jerseys, the T-Mac Yao era ones with like this like slanted shoulders and everything as the angry dildo Rockets jerseys and I will never forget that phrase it is forever ingrained in my brain are you that's sure that's not referring to the rocket with teeth no, no 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 this was referring to the slanted shoulder ones because they were so like sleek on the side this wasn't the pinstripe ones guarantee you and okay. i remember this because i was like 12 years old like browsing clutch fans and i'm like what the hell are they and so from that point on i was like you know what I guess I kind of do see it, and now I can't unsee it, and I hate that. So I have okay. now cursed everybody else with this knowledge. Okay. Truly and honestly, the last thing I'll say, because I got to go, and you do too. But but I hated those jerseys, and I hated them even more when they were done by Adidas. Because when they were done by Adidas, they had the two lines coming from the sleeves. And so the sleeves were just like baggy. They never ended. There was no cutoff. There was no cuff. They just looked stupid and like, like I said, exaggerated and, and spread out. If you look at the version that Nike did, I'm trying to pull it up, but I, I cannot. If you look at the version Nike did, there, I remember, I'm going off the top of my head. I'm trying to find a visual. There were actually, yeah, yeah. There were actually like cutoffs. Like if you look at the the red version, there's gray and there's like an outline of gray. So like you can see where the, where the jersey ends. So much more clean than the Adidas version. Still didn't like them that much. But man, the Adidas version, honestly, one of the worst NBA jerseys, I think, ever that stuck around for longer than like a couple of years. Those, we had those jerseys for like a decade and a half. Um, 
if we were actually on top of our shit, I, I would have taught you how to screen share by now. And for all of our YouTube viewers, they could have seen the jersey that you were talking about by you pressing the screen share button on your side of the software. And we could have done that. A lesson for another time. And that is where we're actually going to kind of end this thing, which is just kind of coming to like an abrupt stop. Like we definitely didn't like slow down at all. We were going zero to like 70 and then just caved. On that note, that's how we're going to wrap this thing down. All right, take us away. Hey man, look, it's the Premier Rockets podcast. I, people... I had to I had to carry us through the last one because your laptop died. In that's mid true. That's true. So so Listen, you to everyone us that, through this one. To everyone that's been listening, we appreciate it, man. Um, you can get this podcast on YouTube if you want to watch it. You can listen to the audio anywhere you get your podcast. Like I said, I host the Noble and Rue show presented by Ball is Life with my co-host Zach Noble. Check that out. We have very good ratings on uh on whatever the podcast thing is for Apple. So I'm proud of that. Subscribe and rate. This one, go give us go give us five stars if you like us. Give us a positive comment. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Give us a like. Give us a comment. Get that algorithm tickled and lubed up. Get it going and juiced. <laughs> and, Not um, us talking about dildos and lube at the end of the podcast. <laughs> Jesus no, but Christ. but seriously, we appreciate everyone listening. Um, you know, this is the third episode. We got a ton more coming. And you know, you can catch us around. You can catch me on Twitter. You can catch Jackson on Twitter. Follow Locked on Rockets. Jackson, anything else you'd like to plug? Your 10 podcasts that you do? <laughs> it's actually uh, up to 12 podcasts since we started this one. No. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, just Locked on Rockets. Follow me on Twitter at JT Gatlin. That's where I yell about everything. Again, also follow the Mastodon over there at Roosh Williams on Twitter. But we are super appreciative of you checking out this show. If you're listening to it, whether you're listening via Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever, if you're watching it on YouTube, thank you so much. Leave us some comments. We do try to be, try our best to reply to those comments. So drop some comments on the YouTube page. We read every single one of those. We try to get and by back we, to as soon as possible. And by we, he means me. But but Jackson will start responding as well. Put me on blast to end the end of the episode. It's not like I manage like six other YouTube channels hey, or none anything. Like, I, honestly, I enjoy doing it. I signed them all <laughs> Roosh, though, so I keep it like that. But hey, none, none like some accountability to keep things rolling, baby, you know. All right. Well, with that, that's how we're going to close things out. We appreciate you for watching. We appreciate you for listening. Be sure to check us back next week for the next episode of State of the Rockets, talking about your Houston Rockets basketball team. Bang, 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 bang.